Welcome back. This is the second video lecture on Chapter 49, Hazardous Materials. And in this uh, video, we're going to discuss some of the stuff you can actually find in the uh, Department, Department of Transportation's ERG book, which uh, there's another video that goes over how to use this book. Make sure you also watch that video within the module. The United States Department of Transportation marking system is characterized by labels, placards, and markings. Okay, they're used when materials are being transported within the U.S. The same marking system is used in Canada. Uh, placards are diamond-shaped indicators, as seen in this picture. They identify a broad hazard class the material inside belongs to. So uh, they'll tell you if it's flammable, if it's poisonous, if it's corrosive. Uh, the United Nations North American Coding System is the most common uh, of, of the placards. And they show four-digit numbers or for identification of hazardous materials. And you'd use that ERG to look up these things. The labels are smaller versions of placards that you find uh, on boxes. And here's a, an example of that. So you'll find labels on boxes of hazardous materials that are being transported. They're placed on the actual individual box and smaller packages. And they only refer to the potential hazard in that particular box, not necessarily... Uh, other items that it's being shipped with. And then you have Chemtrek. Um, dispatchers can assist uh, by collecting more information from organizations like Chemtrek, uh, or you can call Chemtrek. Uh, they have an extensive database of chemical information to assist emergency responders. When you call them, make sure you have the following information. The name of the chemical that's involved, your name or a callback telephone number, uh, the location of the actual incident, and, and what the incident is or problem. Uh, the shipper uh, or manufacturer of a chemical, if, if it's being moved, shipped, the container type that it's in, the rail car or vehicle markings or numbers to identify the actual vehicle that, that's transporting it, uh, the shipping carrier's name and the recipient's name, and any local conditions or exact description of the situation would be very helpful as they try to get you more information on how to manage that scene. On actual buildings or facilities that have hazardous materials inside, you'll find uh, this diamond-shaped system with these placards. Um, here you could see what the red, blue, yellow, and white mean. Red is for fire. Always remember red for fire, flammability. Blue for health. Okay, so it's pro probable, probable health reactions. Uh, yellow, reactivity or radioactivity oftentimes. And then white, special information. So fixed facility marking system, NFPA 704 standard system for identification of the hazardous materials for emergency response outlines a marking system used for fixed, fixed facilities, excuse me, and that's what this is. Uh, the system is characterized by a placard with a set of diamonds that are found on the outside of buildings, doorways to chemical storage areas, fixed storage tanks. These diamond shaped symbol is broken into four smaller diamonds that I just went over. The placards are color coded. Uh, and uh, they tell you the information I just told you about, and each small diamond is rated on a scale of zero, no hazard, to four severe risk. So if you were looking at this uh, diamond above, and you saw three in the red, so that's pretty risky when it comes to if it's flammable or not. That means you have some more minor, more minor than the flammability, because it goes all the way up to uh, four, so you have a two, so it's you know halfway up there. Uh, health risk and uh, reactivity risk. So again, with the fixed facility marking system, permanent manufacturing storage facilities have safety data sheets. Sometimes these are called the MSDS uh, sheets, and they'll be in a binder oftentimes, and it has pretty much every chemical hazard within that facility is in that book. Um, so those MSDS sheets are very useful. They have the chemical makeup of the substance, the potential hazard if it's present, uh, appropriate first aid in the event of an exposure, and other da data for safe handling of the material. So if you weren't able to, uh, if you didn't, let's say you didn't have your ERG on you, uh, if you weren't able to look it up that way or call Chemtrec, uh, which also is on some of these MSDS sheets, then you'd uh, look at this sheet and actually look for any of the information that you need. So again, the Chemtrek number is in the ERG. It could be on this uh, 
MSDS sheet as well. And if that fails, just call lead control or dispatch where you are and have them make the contact with Chemtrack for you. Um, and then as far as identification, you can use MSDS sheets or you can use your ERG. And I believe the ERG is also a downloadable app. I'm not sure if it's free or not, but I'm pretty sure it is. So download that uh, emergency response guide book app. Containers, vessels or receptacles that hold the material, okay? The type, size, and material of the container can provide clues about the nature of the substance inside. So the type of vehicle it is uh, will actually tell you what's inside of it. Often no correlation between the color of the drum and, the, and its possible contents, you know, whatever chemical the drum's carrying. Examples of how hazardous materials are packaged, stored, and shipped are steel or polyurethane drums, bags, high-pressure gas cylinders, railroad tank cars, plastic buckets, above ground and underground storage tanks, cargo tanks, pipelines. All of those are different ways that it's transported. They're divided into two categories based on capacity, bulk storage vessels and non-bulk storage vessels. So your bulk storage vessels include fixed tanks, highway cargo tanks, rail tank cars, totes, intermodal tanks uh, found in buildings that rely on uh, and need to store a large amount of a particular chemical. Secondary containment, uh, an engineered method that controls spilled or released product if the main contain containment vessel fails. Uh, definitely your more corrosive chemicals have secondary containment vessels as well. Your large volume uh, horizontal tanks are common. Their above ground storage tanks, underground storage tanks can hold a few hundred gallons to several million gallons of products, uh, usually made of aluminum, steel, or plastic. So that would be your large volume horizontal tanks. Your totes, they hold 119 to 703 gallons. That's specific for a reason. They have manufacturers that actually make these so they know exactly how much they will hold. Uh, portable plastic tank uh, surrounded by stainless steel. They can contain any type of chemical. Okay, they're very common. They're referred to as intermediate bulk containers. Um, they're portable, so they can be moved from one place to another. Hazardous shipping and storing. Uh, no secondary containment system. That's another important thing to remember with these uh, portable plastic tanks. There's no secondary containment system. Intermodal tanks hold 5,000 to 6,000 gallons. They're pressurized or non-pressurized, depending on the chemical involved, uh, usually shipped, stored, and returned to the shipper. Moving right along. Drums, these are very familiar, right? Uh, Barrel-like containers to store a variety of substances. Construction of the drum is based on the nature of the chemical. Obviously, more corros corrosive chemicals have specific plastics or materials that they have those drums made out of. So, they hold a few ounces to 119 gallons of the product. Once you get to 120 gallons, that's a different classification. All right? There's, very, there's a lot of regulations to these things. That's why there's specific numbers like 119 gallons. Uh, drums, bags, compressed gas cylinders, cryogenic containers, solvents, industrial cleaners, and compounds are all included in the non-bulk storage vessels. Uh, and the drums bar are barrel-like containers. They store a wide variety of substances made out of low-carbon steel, polyurethane, cardboard, stainless steel, nickel, or other materials. Construction of the drum is based on the nature of the chemical. Uh, steel holds flammable liquids, cleaning liquids, oil, and other non-corrosive chemicals, while your polyurethanes holds corrosives, acids, bases, and oxidizers. Okay, so polyurethane, that's going to be used when th the material inside is very corrosive. Cardboard, obviously, is not going to hold uh, corrosive material Your card or liquids. Your cardboard uh, drums are going to be full of solid materials. And then stainless steel holds materials too aggressive or too reactive for other materials. So stainless steel drums mean it's something pretty aggressive inside. Bags are another form of non-storage or non-bulk storage vessels. They're used to store solids and powders constructed out of plastic paper or plastic lined paper. And the specific information on uh, pesticide bags 
is in the name of the product, active ingredient, hazardous statement, total amount of product in the container, manufacturer's name or address, EPA registration number, so on and so forth. So remember that bags can be used to store pesticides. That's going to be a pretty nasty chemical to come in, in contact with. Uh, they're poisonous, highly toxic by all routes, really, of entry. They can cause severe eye damage or skin irritation. Uh, you know, so keep that in mind. Practical first aid treatment is important when it comes to dealing with the, those types of exposures. Uh, moving on, more non-bulk storage vessels are carboys. Uh, transport and store corrosives and other chemicals holds five to fifteen gallons, much like a drum, but smaller, less chemicals. You also have your cylinders; they hold liquids and gases, various substances, and uh, in insulated compressed gas cylinders. The sizes vary. Moving along, cargo tanks. Okay, bulk package that may or may not be permanently attached to a vehicle. They're loaded or unloaded without being removed from the vehicle. Okay. All right, so your cargo tank's going to go through a few of those. So here you have, you have a flammable liquid uh, tanker. A lot of times this is going to be carrying gasoline or uh, liquid food grade products, flammable and constructible liquids. They're oval shaped tanks pulled by diesel tractors. They can carry 6,000 to 10,000 gallons. It's very common to have a leak with one of these um, vehicles, and it's very common to have a leak with a fire because gasoline. Has a, is pretty combustible uh, with very little ignition source. So you have a lot of fires that involve those gasoline trucks. Here we have a chemical hauler, okay? 6,000, 7,000 gallons may be insulated or uninsulated, uh, may have a higher internal working pressure. That's important because a lot of times things will come shooting out of things that are that are high, have a lot of pressure, okay? So that's important to remember. This will carry flammable liquids, mild corrosives, and poisons. Um, you definitely want to this treat this like a hazmat if you have some sort of leak here. Up to 35 psi on that. Uh, here we have a corrosive tanker. You can usually tell because of these stabilizing, I guess you'd call them, bars around it. They have these rings that reinforce the tank. Okay, and that's how you know that this is a corrosive tanker. And these pictures. You could actually find a lot of them uh, in sources like the Emergency Response Guidebook. Again, this holds about 6,000 gallons uh, and operates approximately 15 to 25 psi. That's the pressure. All right, and it's going to have something corrosive inside. Here you have a pressure cargo tanker, holds 1,000 to 11,000 gallons. I'm not going to use pictures like this on tests, so this is just to kind of give you an idea of the different. Uh, vehicles out there and vessels out there with hazmats. All right, so 1,000 to 11,000 gallons has rounded ends. Constructed of steel or stainless steel has a single tank compartment operates at approximately 300 psi. That's a lot of pressure. Uh, there is an explosion hazard if the cargo tank is impinged on by fire. You have an explosion hazard. So you got to be careful. And, th and, th and that's pretty important when it comes to identifying uh, how far away you want to stay from these these things when you look it up in the ERG It'll actually tell you that the containment distance that you want to keep Or the evacuation distance if you will Here we have a cryogenic tanker. You can kind of guess what's in there a low pressure tanker It relies on tank insulation to maintain low temperature. So it's going to be cold inside the control valves are usually in a box like structure on the rear of the tanker all right, you must have special training to operate those valves. Obviously, your awareness level hazmat training isn't enough to do that. Uh, small puffs of white vapor are vented from the control valves. That's common. This is normal and not indicative of an emergency. All right, so you might see this thing kind of off-putting a little bit of vapor as it goes. So whenever you see a vehicle that looks like this, think it's a cryogenic con uh, container. And, and it doesn't mean... Just because it's cryogenic doesn't mean it doesn't have something uh, dangerous in there. If you look at this placard here, you can see that the substance inside is flammable. And, and actually tells you natural gas inside of this container. <clears throat> Tube trailers. This is going to be a trailer that beh carried again behind a semi-truck. Uh, carries compressed gases. 
made up of individual cylinders operates at 3000 to 5000 psi so again you have that explosion potential uh, one trailer trailer can carry several different gases in each tube so keep that in mind as well the valve control box is usually found at the rear of the trailer but you won't want to operate that you're going to need somebody who's specially certified and trained in operating that dry bulk cargo tanks they carry dry bulk goods makes sense not pressurized usually v-shaped okay again this doesn't mean just because it's dry that it doesn't cause potential exposure risk um, it could be a fertilizer or a, some sort of pesticide powder pellet grain uh, it could just be food but there is a potential for hazardous material here and you're going to want to identify uh, any kind of placard or labeling that would uh, let you know about that so that's the last slide for this video um, I know this was more technical, had a lot of more specific stuff, and I don't expect you to memorize any of that, but just kind of keep an overall awareness on how you would get that information if you needed to figure it out.